Hello and welcome again to Prague. Now I was going to talk in this episode about the astronomical clock but I think given its complexity it really deserves to have its own episode and besides there is so much more to see here in the square. Behind me we have the memorial to Jan Hus, one of the most important people in Czech history and also there's a new addition to the square, the Marianne Column. Now 99.9% .9 of you will not have seen this because actually it was only finished with its construction during the COVID-19 uh, lockdown. Also I'm going to talk about here in the square on June the 21st 1621 here in the square was a, an orgy of death, a veritable bloodfest in the aftermath of the Battle of White Mountain. So in front of us is a memorial to Jan Hus, uh, so one of the first religious reformers. Now the location and the size of this memorial is equivalent to how important he is to the Czechs. Now, he was trying to bring about changes to the Catholic religion about 100 years before Martin Luther was nailing his 95 theses to the Wittenberg church door. Now, I'll say that again very slowly, because quite often some of my tourists mishear me, and they think that somehow Martin Luther was making some kind of dirty protest. So, nailing his 95 theses to the Wittenberg church door. Now, I expect a lot of you will have heard of Martin Luther, but not many of you will have heard of Jan Hus. Possibly the reason being is that Jan Hus actually died around about 80 years before the invention of the printing press, the first kind of media. And so when Martin Luther was actually beginning to challenge the Catholic Church, he had access to the first kind of media. And so we know today how important media is for being able to spread your views and opinions, particularly at 3 o'clock in the morning on Twitter. Now he was born in 1372 or thereabouts of quite lowly stock. His name comes from the fact that when he was at school his mother wanted to give his school teacher a goose. And in Czech a goose is a husa. That's why he's known as Jan Hus. Nice story, but it's more likely because he comes from the town of Husinets in southern Bohemia. Jan from Husinets. Interestingly though, in British slang, to give someone the goose means to pinch them on the bottom. Although I'm sure it's not the kind of goose his mother had in mind. Now, when he became a young man, his mother encouraged him to join the priesthood because at that time it was a kind of social mobility, if you like. Uh, it was a good career for a young man to get out of his lowly background. Uh, and besides that, you also got free food, free accommodation, you got free clothing. Well, it was a cassock. Uh, and you also got immediate respect. And so he trained for the priesthood. When Jan became ordained as a priest and had started a lecture at the Charles University, his students, who had studied at Oxford University in the UK, began to introduce him to the writings and thoughts of John Wycliffe, the English religious reformer who had challenged the Catholic Church in a number of ways, such as preaching in the vernacular, that is, the common spoken language. In those days, the services were held in Latin, when ordinary people didn't speak Latin. The only people who spoke Latin were priests, scholars and members of the nobility. So when you went to church on a Sunday morning, I guess it must have been like going to watch a foreign film without any subtitles. I don't know if you've ever done that. Have you watched a foreign film without any subtitles? Well, you should try it. It's a great drinking game. So people come out of church on a Sunday and say, well, what was the sermon like? Oh, it was great. So what did he talk about? Um, well, uh, God, of course. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, Jesus? And? I don't know. I didn't get the bit in between. So when Jan Hus actually started preaching in Czech and translating the Bible into Czech, um, he got a lot of followers at the Bethlehem Chapel, which is nearby, and we're going to talk about later. And they became known as the Hussites, if you like, the proto-Protestants. Now, I ask my people on my tours, if they know what an indulgence is. Some do, but quite a lot of them think it happens to be a big tub of Ben and Jerry's chocolate chip ice cream. Actually, uh, an indulgence was a way of getting forgiveness. What happened was, when you, when you went to confession, uh, the priest would listen to your sins and say, right, you've done something bad, now you need to do something good to balance that up. And that balancing, that good act, was called an indulgence. But of course, people were lazy. Have you done that indulgence yet? Oh, I've had such a busy week. So at a time when the Catholic Church was trying to find ways to raise the money to build all these lovely structures around Europe and of course line their own pockets, they came up with a great idea. You don't actually have to do them, 
you just pay for them. So putting it simplistically, you go to church and say, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. Last week I broke every commandment in the Bible twice. Don't worry, pay 420 groschen. You get your reduced time of purgatory and you get your place in heaven. Now, Jan objected to this because he thought that salvation should be given by God and not by priests and bishops and the Pope. Because his views and opinions had begun to dent the authority of the Catholic Church, the Catholics thought that they actually needed to do something about the Jan problem. So in 1414, he was asked to go and speak to them in Constance, which is now in Germany. Although he knew that his fate had already been decided, he remained naively optimistic that he could win the council over with his arguments, but clearly not that entirely convinced because he made a will before his departure. Now, uh, as expected, it was a bit of a kangaroo court. They listened to what he had to say, and then they denounced him as a heretic and condemned him to die by burning alive at the stake. But uh, this is medieval times. They weren't just happy just to burn this man alive at the stake. No, they waited until his body had cooled down. They took out his heart, gave an extra roasting in the fire. Then they ground up all his black and charred bones and threw them in the River Rhine because they really wanted to make sure that Jan was not coming back to Prague. Now, in Prague, there was rioting in the streets, not just because Jan Hus was a religious reformer, but also he was a Czech nationalist too. He did a lot to actually promote the Czech language. In fact, he'd used or invented some of the letters that are still used in the Czech alphabet today in order to describe the Czech pronunciation. Today he has come to represent the repressed, the suppressed, the weak and the underdog. And this is how the Czechs have written their history. You have to remember that this was part of a larger empire for nearly 400 years, the Austrian Empire, then the Austro-Hungarian Empire. They got their independence in 1918, then they were invaded by the Nazis, they got their democracy back, and then as described in the previous video, they were taken over by the communists. So the monument was unveiled here unofficially in 1915, 500 years after the death of Jan Hus. And essentially the Austrian authorities didn't really want this memorial to be put here, or didn't want it to be erected because of what it was symbolically as the Czechs were trying to get their independence. So looking at it, I suppose in a way, this is kind of like a huge middle finger to the Austrian authorities saying, we want our independence and we want it now. Now in 1968, when the troops and tanks of the Warsaw Pact invaded Czechoslovakia to crush the Prague Spring, and the Prague Spring was this five to six month period of liberal reforms here in Czechoslovakia, where the Czechs tried to throw off some of those communist restrictions. It's said that the Czechs climbed up onto the memorial behind me and put a blindfold around the eyes of Jan Hus because they didn't want their legend to see their country being invaded yet again. This, the new arrival on the square, is known as the Marianne Column. The column was erected here shortly after the end of the Thirty Years' War, which were a series of brutal and devastating religious and political wars that ravaged Europe, particularly Germany, for, as the name implies, 30 years. And the events that led up to the start of the wars happened here in Prague, following the second defenestration, that is, throwing people out of the window, in 1618 up at Prague Castle. So the column was put here as a way of saying thank you to the Virgin Mary who had helped defend the city of Prague from the marauding Swedes who invaded and tried to take over the city in 1648. Over time, the Marian column became a symbol of oppression by the Austrians over the Czechs, the German language and Catholicism. Therefore, it's not a coincidence that a counter symbol of all of these mentioned, that is freedom, battling against oppression, the Hussite movement, was placed directly opposite the Marianne Column in the form of the Jan Hus Memorial in 1915. So when the country got its independence in October 1918, the Marianne Column, which had stood here for nearly 268 years, was torn down by an angry mob in November 1918. Now already afterwards there was talk to put it back, and after the Velvet Revolution in 1990, a committee was formed to raise funds for its replacement. And finally, it was put back here in the square, in its original place, on June the 4th, 2020. So the Marianne column behind me was torn down in 1918, November 1918, after the Czechs got their independence from the Austrians. It had come to symbolize oppression and Catholicism. And it's somewhat ironic that today, at this time of filming, 
People around the world are tearing down statues that have come to symbolize from their past slavery, oppression and colonialism. People are deconstructing their past. But somewhat ironically, here in the Czech Republic, they are reconstructing their past. OK, so we're going to leave the Marianne column now. We're going to wander over this way to my left. And what we're going to do is go back to the old town hall and we're going to talk about the Battle of White Mountain. Now, quite often, uh, when people come to Prague and they come to the old town square, they ask me, what do these crosses symbolise just down here in front of the old town hall? So here are the 27 crosses that signify the 27 noblemen that were executed after the Battle of White Mountain here in 1620, the last of the religious wars. So you can see we've got a date here. Can you see this lead here? And what this does, uh, it actually is at the top there, we've got the 21st of June, 1621. Now the battle took place at a place called White Mountain, which at that time was outside of Prague, but now today is part of Prague. And it was one of the battles in the Thirty Years' War, which I mentioned previously. It was a battle between the Bohemian Protestant Estates and the Catholic Habsburgs. It took place on 8th of November, 1620. There were 21,000 Protestant troops and 28,000 Catholics. And one of the Catholic troops was the now famous father of modern philosophy, the Frenchman René Descartes, who in the previous year had come up with his famous quote, Cogit ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Now the Protestants arrived at White Mountain after a long march and had not prepared properly, but they had the advantage that they had the high ground. Even so, it didn't go well, and it was all over in an hour with 2,000 dead on each side and the Protestants well and truly routed. After the traditional victors looting, the Catholics looked to exact revenge on their Protestant foe and drew up a list of 27 barons, knights and burghers, young and old, Czech and German, who would be executed on June 21st, 1621. According to contemporary paintings, the scaffold was constructed up against the wall of the old town hall, which is behind me. The executions, which comprised beheadings and hangings, started at dawn and went on for nearly four hours. One observer said it was an atrocious spectacle. I think that's putting it mildly. As this contemporary painting depicts, the square here was packed with people and soldiers and the executions took place according to rank. So Joachim Schlick who was a nobleman and one of the troop commanders, was beheaded first, followed by the 74-year-old Václav Padova. The severed heads of 12 were taken in an iron basket and exhibited on one of the towers on Charles Bridge. Besides the executions, a lot of people here were publicly flogged and punished for being part of the Protestant uprising. One unfortunate man, actually, because he had welcomed King Frederick, the Protestant king, and his wife Queen Elizabeth to Prague in the previous year, actually had his tongue nailed to the scaffold for two hours. Ouch! Or, I suppose it's more likely to be sort of... Ah! The ramifications for the defeat of the Protestants at the Battle of White Mountain were hugely significant and impactful. The Protestants were exiled from the country, uh, their lands were seized by the Catholics, and also in 1624, German was declared as the official language here. So Czech actually became a minority language. It kind of moved out from Prague and was spoken in little towns and little villages. We didn't actually see the revival of the Czech language until the nationalist revival here in the 19th century. Now for some years the question was asked, why had the Protestants done so badly against the Catholics at the Battle of White Mountain, given that initially they had the advantage over the Catholics by holding the high ground? After some analysis, they decided that one possible reason may be that the Bohemian Protestants actually didn't give their army, a lot of whom were peasants, any weapons. For the very simple reason they thought they might rise up and use the weapons against them. Now, I don't know very much about fighting battles or military or how to conduct troops, but I would have thought it's a bit obvious that if you're hoping to actually win a battle as a commander, it might be a good idea to give your troops some weapons. I mean, just a little thought for the future there. There is one more thing we need to talk about before we leave the Old Town Square, 
and this is that there is an old legend that on the anniversary of the execution of these poor unfortunate souls in 1621 their spirits rise up and they cross the old town square to take communion at the church of Our Lady before Tin but in the Protestant way only as you can see this year they uh, had to take a bit of a detour because of the Marianne column So now we've left the Old Town Square and we're standing in front of this beautiful and magnificent astronomical clock. If you have enjoyed coming around with me today and enjoyed this video, then please don't forget to click and subscribe and don't forget to press the little bell button so you will get notifications. Thank you and look forward to seeing you next time.